Question from Eva Matt. I teach level three and I use the target language 100% and it's possible. I understand with lower levels it might not be possible. Bless your heart, Eva. Thank you. Uh, you are a example to us all. I am thinking in terms of a career and not just getting through a year. I would also ask you, are you 100% sure when you use the target language 100% time of the time that your students are understanding 100% of what you're saying? I'm not trying to be not snotty there. I'm just, I don't know. But wow, that's amazing. Um, listen, these are just, we're all going to have our own individual experiences with this. This is just my opinions. I don't mean to offend anybody. Hope I'm not offending anybody. I'm just speaking my truth. Yeah, Christine Webb, I think you wanted a video. Did we talk about that? Go to YouTube, Ben Slavic, Pringle Man, or Candy the Corn, two Ks there. Naruto is another one. Oh. Carol Gobb corrects me. Well, I defer to the, the experts. The number is a target, I think, Maybe she's referring to my 50%. Carol Gom, the number is a target in the figurative sense. I agree with that. We should try to stay in the target language as much as possible. I agree with that. Some classes, though, you can't stay, you know, more than 30% in there because if it's a rough crowd or whatever like that. Um, some classes you can stay in 90%, and Carol is so correct there. Ooh, that just somebody else asked a question and I lost it. There's, there's Carol. The point is we should be, and this is quoting Carol, it's like it comes out of Susan Gross's mouth or Blaine Ray's mouth or Carol Gobb's mouth. It's real. The point is we should be in the target language whenever possible. I think we can do much, much better than 50%. Yeah, you know, I think I agree with that, Carol. Um, I'm an old dude, and I got to the point in my career where I, was, I just felt so tired of like getting on the horse and ripping through another 52 minute classroom and staying in the target language all this difficult. Sometimes I, I if back to what I can't remember your name, Eva, I think said about staying in the target language 100%. I've done that. I do that quite a bit, but it's what's realistic and it's what Carol said. It's, it's what's realistic and, um, I don't know, <laughs> Kim Hawkins. I'm feeling like I'm deferring to the experts like Carol. And then Kim Hawkins comes up and says, yes, Ben, you the man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I think we should all be able, I, you know what? There's this cult of you got to do it the way the people tell you to do it. No, you don't. Grow your own. Make it reflect your own personality. personality. Oh, Carol, again, I, I think the target should be rewritten to read 90% interaction with CI versus the target language. That's a heavy. Um, so she's telling uh, ACTFAL that we should go with 90% interaction with comprehensible input. I like that. Carol, do you agree that what I said before, though, is you can't go like salt and pepper back and forth between the two languages. It just confuses the mind. Um, so then Carol goes on. We do this. I love that expression. Paul Sandrock needs to know about this. 90% interaction with CI. And Carol was saying 90% inter interaction with CI as opposed to 90% interaction with the target language. Maybe get a clarification on that, Carol, if you're still here. Uh, through various approaches like one word images, movie talk, guided reading, free voluntary reading with comprehensible texts, and she says we can meet and even exceed the 90%. Y'all are good teachers. Y'all are good teachers. If you can do that 90%, my hat's off to you. But the thing is, 
uh, Carol mentioned movie talk. Uh, again, this is a personal thing with each of us. I tried movie talk and I was just terrible at it. Um, I don't think that I, I didn't have my students have a strong enough uh, established meaning vocabulary base in movie talk. But, you know, this is what's great about comprehensible input. It's, it's a vast universe where each of us gets to develop our own relationship uh, with the teacher's discovery, weighed in. Uh, Janet Smith, Carol Gobb, agreed. That's a really good point. All of the authentic sources that I use definitely make it also easier, but I do tend to think of TL, target language, as only what is spoken by me as the teacher. The thing is with authentic sources, um, Janet, I respectfully disagree. I, I accept really, I, on my website, you can find, if you teach French, you can find a marvelous collection of French poetry. Um, because French literature is a big thing in my life. And I found the simple stuff, Prévert, stuff like that, really simple. So, yeah, but that's accessible and under, understandable by the kids. Authentic sources don't work for me. They work for Janet. Bless all of our hearts. We don't need to argue about this stuff. We only need to be doing what we is, we're drawn to as people. As individual, back in before 2000, there was a guy named Mogoloko Thompson in Beaufort, South Carolina. And he, he defined teachers who use comprehensible input as that we all get to do what we want as individual teaching artists. What a great expression. We're individual teaching artists and none of us is trying to do it the right way because there's no right way of interpreting something as vast as Stephen Krashen's and Dr. Benico Mason's work and all the other, I say Dr. Krashen, but I'm really encapsulating everybody. Uh, don't mean to focus only on Krashen because all of the researchers have done such a great job of setting us up for this new century. What are these stories you're talking about, Deb? Um, not sure what you mean. Uh, Oh, Janice actually responded to Deb, the process of providing input through telling stories. Yes. So that's Blaine Ray's great gift is, is uh, we learn at the summer conferences how to tell stories and we teach our students the stories and the language comes for, along for the ride. An important thing about all this is that when you look at your students and they're focused on the message as we talked about earlier in the webinar, they're not focused on the language, and the language sneaks in Trojan horse style into the unconscious mind. They go to sleep. The uh, mechanics that happened in the, un the unconscious mind during sleep are so complex, we could never begin to learn uh, of, um, acquire foreign language without sleep. That's when it all happens. And, but it's the, pro it's the stories, uh, Deb, that provide the input. I hope that um, that answers your question. Carol Gobb responds to Deb. They could be co-constructed stories. That is, when you say co-constructed, you, 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 that's what you do with stories, is the teacher and the students create the stories. They could be one-word image stories. And that's, again, I keep talking about my new, my new book. I'm really excited and I really like to share it with a lot of people. Um, the Invisibles, one word images. You can generate stories from them. I really have a precise, oh, hey, Lynn, so would you get, hey guys, would you get, get me those, uh, that one star graphic? It's like a, a against, a, yeah, it's like a big poster about yeah. this big, thanks. Yeah. And, and Lana, yeah. and then come and hold it behind me because like, it's too big to get close to the screen. Sorry, right. I really want to show you this. Uh, Carol Gobb goes on saying, um, well, okay, let's stop there and go on with OWI, Fabiola, thank you for that question. What's this? One word images. Um, I've been doing for them for 20 years, but I think the greater CI community picked up on them about four years ago. And uh, I don't know, I, I, one word images. Um, go to benslavic.com. Uh, it's in here. 
It's in here. Do you want the one with it's in here. words on it? The one with the star. Oh. The, the picture? Yeah. Okay. The big the big graphic. Teacher's Discovery says Ben will spend a few minutes at the end answering questions as well. Um, Deb, Deb says, I've got to write stories. What? No. No. No, no. Uh, the one, it's a, on poster board on the right side next to the fireplace to the right. Um, yeah, Deb Buckley, you've got to write stories. No, you don't have to write stories at all. You generate them in class and write them up later. This is all much bigger than we can just say here at the end of our webinar. Martha Cox Stavros, one word images. TD just posted a link to a document by Ben describing what it is and the process to create. Thank you, Teachers Discovery. Thank you, Lana. Um, maybe I can just hold it right here. Let's see. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, everybody, look at this. Nice. Thank you, Lana. Yep. This is the star sequence curriculum. This is only in, because I just invented it in 2017. It's only in the new books on the invisibles. Watch. See the star in the middle? See the create at the top? That's the first stage. Um, the person who just asked Martha, just asked about, or somebody did, that you have to create stories. No, you don't have to write stories. You create the stories auditorily ver with class, in class, by doing a one-word image or whatever. And then we'll watch. You're going to, go to, you're going to go over to the review phase. Can you see those words? And it's a very precise system going around the star. You do those things. You, you retell it, you reveal it, and you do a quiz. And then you write options one and two. Can't go into that right now. And then you go to all of my reading options. I used to have 21 of those 10 years ago. I was a very happy camper one day when my boss, Diana Noonan, walks in to my classroom at East High School in Denver. And she, I had these reading options up there, silent reading, teacher reads, pair work. And I demonstrated them. And she said, I like that. I was happy that day. I also had Stephen Crash in my classroom for two um, class periods one time, and he dissed half of these because they weren't in perfect line alignment with his research. Uh, and I, my response, I got very brave, and I said, "Well, Dr. Crash, and you're not a classroom teacher. This stuff works to help you get through a classroom really well, uh, a reading class." But after you create the image, top of the 12 o'clock on the star, and then you review the image, 2 o'clock, and then at 4 o'clock you write up the image, and then you read the image. This is like, this is 20 years of work, y'all, um, in one graphic. And then you read it. That's the most important part of the whole thing. And then you extend it by these ideas that I invented over the years, like Dicte. Uh, I did not invent free rights. That was... Uh, the TPRS community, the word chunk team game I invented. Uh, one, the O Watts is uh, Rob is uh, the great um, doctor um, in Atlanta. The Latin teacher, his name is. It'll come back to me. Um, sorry, interviews. That's I think something we got from the greatest French CI teacher I know. Sabrina Janzak, if you can ever see her teach. She's up there with uh, the greatest CI teachers ever. Uh, Sabrina, and uh, actually, need to keep going, getting kind of getting. Yeah, Rachel Martin, you were totally right. She said, I thought the basics of CI were going to be discussed. I'm brand new to this and was hoping to learn how to even start. Um, I kind of took it out of the box on the idea that from Teachers Discovery that we would want to be doing about uh, talking about the theory of CI, and I think I got a little more complicated on you than I should have, and I apologize for that. Maybe we can do another session on the, the really basics of it. Um, but the thing is, if you just read this book right here, it's it's really not something you can just like 
it, there's a lot to it, but those are in those books. Okay. Our state tests, here's a question, our state tests have speaking 30 points and writing 20 points at level one. You know, we had that in Denver Public Schools up till about 2011. And I personally just, and a lot of people in Denver Public Schools finally realized that's absurd. And I'm saying, and so that this Deb is saying, and now Ben, you're saying no speaking or writing till April of level two. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, I think doing speaking and writing assessments at level one is, um, I don't know, a disaster. I don't know what the, there's no strong enough word for it because it flies in the face of the research. Teachers Discovery has left a message that says if anyone would like to be a, to have a participation certificate for professional development e email, H Bauer, that's H B A U E R at teachersdiscovery.com, and you'll get a certificate for this. Kim Hawkins, do you model or coach these nonverbal responses to show comprehension? Comprehension. What I do is sit down. I when I realize in the first week that my kids are having trouble because they 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 don't understand the the, the what I'm asking them to do, which is, I sit down in the chair and I model it. I just sit down and act like what, I, I, this takes about a minute or two and I just sit in the desk and I say, this is what I wanna see from you. And then what I do is if they don't do it, and they never do, I go to my classroom rules, also um, published by Teachers Discovery, and I go over and I walk there and put my hand on classroom rule number two and classroom rule number two is the best rule out of all the hundreds of rules that have dwindled down to six or seven rules now in the poster from teachers discovery i put my hand on it and i look over at the kid and i and it's silence and i say and, and then they read one person speaks and the others listen and i have to do that and if you're just getting ready to start the year, you should do that 70 or 80 times in the first class, 60 or 70 times in the second. Stop what you're doing. If you're doing card talk or circling with balls, anything like that, this is the same thing. Whatever comprehensible input that you are giving, stop class, walk over, put your hand on that rule, let them read in silence, and then this is the part, if you're gonna fail at this, you're gonna fail here. You're gonna go back to teaching. And one kid who says one thing should stop you immediately. And you just calmly walk back. I've been doing this for 15 years, it, it, it works. It, just walk back to the poster with the classroom rules. They're on my website too. <clears throat> Put your hand on it. Do it again five seconds later. Classroom management is best done by engaged students and the police force of the student jobs described in the Invisibles books. I don't know. I, I do apologize, Rachel Martin. I think it was you who said that you wanted more basics here or Kim Hawkins, no, somebody, I can't remember. I, I really do apologize for that. Um, the, com, I thought I covered it at the beginning though. Comprehensible input is about delivering understandable messages to students. That's, the, that's what you do. And then what we need to do is talk about all that. Martha, I find that my students want to speak. <clears throat> Hey, Teacher's Discovery, could you like send me a message here and tell me how we're doing on time and all? Martha, I find that my students want to speak even in the first weeks of school. Then let them. Oh, that's just cool, Martha. She says, I have functional language prompts around the room and rotate different posters for rejoinders. That's Bryce Hedstrom. 
throughout the year. But I don't correct them when they speak. I model. Beautiful. Really nice. And as Martha continues, and assessment is focused more on comprehension. Thank you. I give what's called a quick quiz. It's just a five point or a 10 point quiz. I have a kid whose job is to write the quick quiz in English and I translate it when I give the quiz. It's all in the books. It's all in all those books I've been showing you. Um, strong teacher, wow, Martha. Our district requires that we use a textbook, but I use it mostly as a roadmap and a, adapt activities to reflect TCI practices. Although, Martha, I would say, uh, this is Ben Slavic, this is my opinion, I'm allowed it. <clears throat> um, I'm, people aren't gonna agree with me, I'll, I'll a big time on this. Um, where is that? Okay, I'll just be brief. <clears throat> We don't want to commit professional malpractice. If we're in a department that requires us or, or insists, pretty kind of says, use the book, <clears throat> use the textbook, then that's what we need to do. We work for that, those people. We want to get along with them. And, and I've, I've been the maverick on this where I've tried to, in, um, to put my views about comprehensible input on my colleagues, and it never works. <clears throat> So my advice on what that last sentence from Martha was, our district requires the textbook and I adapt activities and assessments to reflect comprehensible input practices. I don't think you can do that. Because the, the malpractice is, <clears throat> what happens is if you do what the department says and you stay with the textbook, that's malpractice in a way because the textbook doesn't align with the research. So really, by using the textbook, you're using something that doesn't align with the, the research. I call that malpractice. But if you do uniquely comprehensible input, I, I, that's kind of malpractice because the people in the building all expect you to align with the common assessments that have been painfully built and, and you have to respect that. So my advice is, and I, this is a result of 19, 20 years of, of working with comprehensible input, is don't try to mix them. And again, it's just my opinion. You can't, I was never able to take a list of uh, semantic set words, thematic units, backwards planning for a novel, high frequency uh, verb list, and, and say, we're gonna use comprehensible input, we're gonna create a story, and then they'll, 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 they'll know the words in the list. That's not what Krashen says. It's not, not how we acquire languages. We don't target stuff, we just, drown them in language and after two or three or four years they may to, they may not have memorized the words for the all the common assessments along one way but they know a hell of a lot more language at the end of that time because the the the, the failure of a lot of us um and i think i i really feel like i get crashing on this is that we learn and the person who asked about i need some basics on on comprehensible but the basic thing is that it's an unconscious process. And so when you focus on lists, you engage the conscious mind. It's like let the unconscious process of free flowing language go into the, I can see people's, I can see people shaking their heads now, I can't even see you. But again, it's my deal, this is my webinar. <laughs> um, take the pressure off yourself, drop the list, all those lists, all those targets to learn. Watch them learn 10 times faster because you're staying true to the research that we learn languages unconsciously. And do one or the other. The solution, to, instead of mixing comprehensible input like Martha just said into the textbook, for me, for me, we all, we're, aren't we allowed to disagree, is I'll teach what I have to teach for my bosses in the textbook for 30 or 40 minutes. And then I'll say to the class, all right, we've done the important stuff. Let's just hang out in French for a while. And then we'll do a one word image or a story or something like that. And you do that 10 minutes at the end of class in September, October, they're gonna come in and say, can we do a little 
Can we just hang out? No. We're learning this and we have to stay close to our curriculum. We're going to be in the textbook and you're going to learn this stuff so you can get ready for level three or level two or whatever. And that is very important to respect the department you work in and do what they do as a department. Now, and if you're in all, if you're in an all CI department, God bless you. Then you can, you can pursue CI the whole period. But as far as mixing the two, I think you just keep them separate, teach the grammar, whatever you have to teach. You can teach it in, in half the time of a regular class period. I mean, how long does it take to, to do whatever you have to do to teach the grammar? It doesn't take the whole period. Have you ever been in a class? I remember when I was teaching grammar, it was feel like you're, you're like a 52 minute class and you're like 30 minutes into it and you feel like you, it's been forever and you got to do it four more times. That never happens in a comprehensible in-book classroom, but um, it, you, you can get through a 52 minute class and with 42 minutes of, of what you're supposed to teach and do 10 minutes of CI. And then gradually by the, by the spring, those numbers have reversed. But the idea of doing ac CI activities does not compute with me. Oh, and your question is, well then how are they supposed to learn what they're supposed to learn? Well, first of all, they're what they need to learn, you know, for the test. Well, first of all, they don't need to learn that to acquire the language. They need to learn those lists and things for the test. And so I think the testing thing is a really big um, thorn in the side. And I think all the experts would agree with me that testing is just not something that you can measure what they know, you know, in the first few years. Again, just my opinions. But yeah, like Deb just said something in response to Martha. Yeah, Martha. Deb said really well, the kids want to use the language and who cares if it's perfect. So listen to it. You guys are good teachers because if you're getting the kids just throwing out all kinds of language and if it's grammatically imperfect, let them do that. But I don't know, I never experienced that until like, like I said, spring of level two, all that kind of like, you know, unforced expression, speech. Um, Deborah Cohn, walk before you talk. The, you really, that's a great question because walking before you talk, Okay, I'm gonna make it really simple. But if you really want to know the, the, the whole chapter on it, buy my book, <laughs> The Invisibles, only available so far. I don't know if Teachers Discovery is gonna want it or not at benslavic.com. But here it is. I'll make it really simple. As soon as you want to establish meaning for something that you said in class that you know they don't know. Well, let's say you want to teach um, she runs. Usually what comprehensible input teachers do is they go, Ed cool, you know, and all that. And then they have to think about all these ways to, to make sure it's, the student understands it. Let's take a shortcut. Let's not have to use all those skills. Let's just shut up, put our, tape over our mouth before we say el cool. Walk over, I wish I had a little whiteboard here. Here, there's a white, the back of that one. Now, so this is back here. And stop, you, you, you know, you wanna say she runs, you want that to come into your head. It comes into your head, you're telling the story, you're going, you know, your little la petite arrière chambre, you know, in the back, you got to say, oh, now I have to establish meaning on she runs after you say it. That's so awkward. Here's walk before you talk. I'll just, like I'm in class now, okay? Internal dialogue, teaching, you know, the teaching dialogue. Oh, Ben, don't say that right now. Walk over there first. Write it down in both languages. I was going to have a whiteboard ready for this. 
but I forgot about the time zones. So you're gonna walk to the board. You can keep your mouth shut. You're gonna walk to the board. You're gonna write the. We're gonna write it down in silence. Then you're gonna take your hand and you're gonna go like this. Just put it on there and then you say it. You're walking before you talk. You don't say anything. You walk over to the board. You write it down and only then do you go like there. And then, only then, um, Deborah, do you open your mouth. So you walk, you let your feet do their thing. I'm sitting down, but in, if I if I demo, well, hang on, maybe I can. This is back here. Class. And cool. What that does is it obviates all those other skills. They know what it they know what it means by looking at it. People will say, well, that's not going to lead to good acquisition because it makes them rely on the translation. So what? In the reading phase, there are used to be 21 when Crashton was in my classroom. There's 11, I think, 11 or 12. Really effective, really effective. ways to get repetitions on El Cour. It's going to be written up. You can embed in the, some verb, form, verb tense you want, like um, you want to teach the past tense. Well, that's when you teach your grammar. By the way, reading the reading phase of this star it's just automatic. You start at noon and you come around back to noon. And when you go through the reading phase, which is where all the great comprehensible input, listening um, and, and reading happen. By the way, there's this one thing called um, it's not even on here. Reading from the back of the room. I invented that in India. You got to get on that thing. Because what you do is you create a story and it's up, it's in the reading phase, it's projected, you know, on the screen and the kids are, are there and they're reading it and you're pointing out, you've seen that done at conferences. And then you walk around to the back of the room and you're the only one Then you have them turn to you. And so you're the only one that can see the text and you go like this. Class. Key cool. Who runs? And they, this is impressive when, when admins walk in and they say, la fille cool. They know that the girl runs because it's written up in the story and you've been doing all these different reading. I am a major, um, I don't use circling um, to get my repetitions. I, I go around here and, and, and so it's more contextualized repetitions, if you will. I, I don't just say the subject and the verb one after another because I think it gets boring. But I do um, get many, many, I mean, many repetitions in the reading phase with all those activities. But if you do reading from, I hope I explained that clearly. You really want to do um, reading from the back of the room. It's projected. You walk to the back of the room. They all turn to you. You ask questions off the text. The administrator says, my God, these kids can speak the language. Well, of course they can. They created the character. They created the story that came from it. They have, they have buy-in, you know. I don't think a text that is not generated by the kids is advisable in the first few, uh, few years. Certainly not in the first year. Uh, Deborah, I hope that was sufficient on walk before you talk. All it is is you, you, before you say it, you walk over to the board, you write it down in both languages, and then you put your hand on it. I'll say that again. 
because it's a skill that could really make your year a lot easier. I wish I'd thought of it 20 years ago. <clears throat> you know you want to say something. El cool. You want, to, you want to communicate to your students the idea in the form of comprehensible input that she runs. You don't say it. You walk to the board. You write it down in both languages. You put your hand on the target language version, which is on the left. And then you say it. And then every single kid in the class understands it. And when that happens, your classroom management problems don't exist because everybody understands and they want to know what happens. Is the new skill the invisibles? No, the new book is Jessica Bennett LeBlanc. Is the new skill is the, the, the new book is the invisibles, 2019. This is 2014 and yet massively applicable. This is 2016, I think, 2017, 2019. Um, you could call this and this, and they're on, they're on my side besides uh, Teachers Discovery, they're banslavic.com. Those are first, the first two books of a trilogy, really, that leads up to The Invisibles. The Invisibles book is the best thing I've ever written. And I know it says on my website that the Big CI book is the best thing I've ever written, but that was in like about 2016 that I wrote that. <clears throat> it just keeps getting better. And I think I can only say that, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I, I taught for 24 years before that, whatever. I mean, it's, you can't just, please accept this advice from somebody who's been there. I remember when Susan Gross used to come to my classroom in Colorado Springs, she, her husband was a lawyer and he'd come to Denver. And so she'd stop off here and just walk in. One time she walked in in a snow storm early in the morning and said, I'm, I'm ready to teach your classes for you then. And I, I sat back at the desk and, and I, I didn't understand what she was doing. I had no idea. And I was frustrated. And I was frustrated for eight years to the extent where I ended up writing TPRS in a year just because I learned by writing. And it took me eight years to get a handle on CI. So for the person who wants the basics, um, you know, I don't think it's so easy to communicate in a webinar. I think you have to read. And that's this book, the, the good stuff on the basics of CI. That's why we call it the big CI book. Go figure. <clears throat> so do we have to buy the book to know what, what is the skill to rule them all? Um, <laughs> you know, no, I just explained it. But let's not get snarky about all this. I just devoted my life to writing books about that. It's okay for you to buy the book, but uh, by the way, I wanna say this. If you are unable to pay for one of these books, and if you can't get the school to pay for it, it's yours for free. Just tell me in an email. I know that there's a big money grab in the CI market right now. Please don't associate me with that. If you do, you don't know me. Do students draw on paper or online? Kim, they could draw online. Uh, somebody just had an idea on my PLC that suggested that, it's brilliant. Can't remember who it was. Oh, I know, there's a great uh, CI teacher in Mississippi, Scotty. Um, Mr. What's his name? Senor? Oh, I can't remember. I wanna remember his name. Make sure you know about him because he's great. Um, anyway, he came up with the idea of the kids drawing on kind of legal size type paper and then he puts it on the projector and projects it. And that way we don't have all the, uh, the big, which is what I do, the big um, 
butcher block paper. But the reason I want the butcher block paper is because I put the drawings in a gallery. And I remember I did that in India in 2015, and it was just so cool because the gallery, the art gallery in the back, produced by the student jobs, the kids who do uh, the artists, there's two of them. One is a primary and one is a secondary artist. They sit at their table and they have their turf over there. And then at the end of class, their, their drawings go up and kids come in from other classes just to see the, the latest artwork for that day. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of, uh, of the, the Invisibles. Autre Nolan, oui c'est moi, thank you. <laughs> Over there in France, obviously, or maybe Quebec, somewhere in Africa. Welcome to our webinar. Well, de rien. TPR, Teachers Discovery has a link, posted a link to my TPRS training videos. Hey, I didn't know you had those. Thank you. Hey, by the way, shout out to Teachers Discovery. They are, they are um, moving the conversation forward. Heather and Charles and, and um, all those great people over there. Um, Y'all, here we have a company that's helping us communicate with each other to get better at CI. You know what, it's about time because, you know, we've been doing it on our own. If you look back at the load that, that Carol Gobb and Blaine Rain and all of them great innovators have, have carried on their shoulders, going around doing workshops all the time. Um, workshops are really hard to do. You gotta, you know, it's just terrible. It's just like, now we're using some technology, we're, we're starting to communicate with each other and that's a really good thing. So thank you, a shout out to Teachers Discovery for what they're doing. I did not know you had my TPRS training videos online. Um, oh, Tracy, <laughs> sorry. She said there's lightning in my area and my computer shut off and wouldn't come back on. What did I miss? And will there be a way to watch the entire thing again? Charles, who's in charge of the tech at Teachers Discovery, has told me that he will be able to post this entire webinar um, for your uh, enjoyment, edification, whatever. Um, and if you just go to the Teachers Discovery website, you'll be able to watch this whole thing. Deb, what books can brand new language learners read? I don't advise them reading books in level one at all. I advise them reading their stories because you don't have that much time and you want to keep the interest all the way up to the top. For me, that's, uh, that's my reality. So I say, if you, if you, if you follow that, <laughs> How embarrassing. If you follow that graphic behind my right shoulder, why give them a book to read? Because no book could be as interesting as what they create. At the top of that star on that purple thing, it says create. And I might as well just go get it. Look at, look at those three things. By doing card talk, which I've been doing for 20 years, individually created images, five years, one word images, 17 years. I've been doing those. You create a drawing. Now, again, this is just me. I'm not trying to sell this. I mean, in terms of going up to other people, trying to sell it, obviously, but I don't want to go up to other people like experts and say, this is the way to do it. Everybody has to do it this way. This is the way I do it. You do card talk, individually created images, and one word images and you create a drawing and everything unfolds from there. But because the kids created it, it has greater interest. And that goes back to that word compelling. Books may be interesting for the kids who can read them. Let's not go into the equity piece again because you can divide a class with a novel, you can divide a class right down, split down the middle. Kids can read it, kids who can't. 
I'm not about that. I'm about building community before I, if, if I don't have a community, that's a whole nother piece. I know I'm too much information. I don't know how else to say it, but my prime, my, my prime comprehensible input priorities are classroom management via building community, via the student jobs. High engagement, high engagement, compelling, interesting stuff, which I think is just higher when they, when they read stuff they create. So I'm, I'm recommending no books in level one. I think, I think they, they, and also Susan Gross, I never forgot this, told me that when the students read, it should be like a movie in their mind. And so if you hand them a book in level one that is about somebody, some kid or something, and it's simple to the, te to the teacher, it's a foreign language to the kid, and they may, if they don't have a strong middle school reading background, this brings in the equity piece. Your classroom runs the risk of being divided down racial, social, economic lines between readers and non-readers. And you don't want that because that's where classroom management problems come up. So I'm saying read in level one. Y'all, again, I have to say this over and over and over. It's just my opinion. It's my, my own experience. It's my own life as a language teacher is what I learned. This is what I learned as a language teacher. I'm sure it's not the right way. We all have different modalities in the way we teach. And this is the way I teach. A teacher's discovery and answer to the question about if you got lightning in your area and missed this, we will, we will be posting this video on YouTube afterwards and we'll share a link to it on our Facebook page. Joan, John Bagney, John. I have several Blaine Ray readers. They are super simple and can be understood after a few weeks of class. First novel is called Pobreana. That's awesome. Do it. I, I had, I taught, after I taught at East High School in Denver, I taught at Lincoln High School, which is 90% Latino uh, and then about 90%, or actually 98% uh, immigrants, newly arrived kids, new Americans. And there was this kid in the back who hadn't been in the U.S. for three, maybe three, four months. And I, I was trying to work in, I think it was Pobreana, although I just French is Pobreana. He couldn't read it. That's a big deal to me. So if you have, maybe, John, if you teach in the suburbs and you have like kids who are privileged and have had books around their house in middle school, yeah, go for it. Again, we, we all do what we do. John, if you do use, okay, Deb asked if you're a German teacher, if you do use um, novels, get Robert Harrell's. Robert Harrell. North Sea Pirates. John Bagby, he says, most Blaine Ray novels are available in lots of languages, TPRS publishing. I think that's Carol. No, I'm not sure. Carol has uh, Fluency Matters. Well, I, I hear that, John, but I, I gotta go with, um, Quality of work is, is what's come out of the last 15 years out of uh, Fluency Matters and Carol Gobbs' books, which is fantastic. Unmatchable. Yeah, it's, it's Fluency Matters. Christy Placido just came in and said that TPRS Publishing is now called Fluency Matters. So that's where you want to go and get your novels. Carol, thank you for saying that. Because I, I, the whole time I've been talking, I've said, I've said to myself, Carol's not going to want to hear this because I don't use the novels in level one and halfway through level two. But then, you know what I do, Carol? I give them your, your books, your level one books at the end of level two, and they can do what my mentor told me to do, which is make it 
the reading be like a movie in their minds. They've had so much comprehensible input from the stories and the create phase over there and the reading phase on the star. Such a, such a solid curriculum right there behind me. I know it's circular, but it's so solid. And I, I felt the whole time I said, okay, I'm dissing the novels. And then Carol says, this is, this is how classy Carol Gobb is. Amen, Ben. Make your teaching style approach reflect your own personality. Mm -hmm. That's right. Carol Gobb is telling me that it's all right for me to teach the way I want to teach. That's a big deal. Thank you, Carol. And Carol Gobb wrote back, thanks, Ben. This is the way we should be, you know, instead of like, have you ever seen like somebody, there's a new expert out there and somebody and all of a sudden they know everything and you're supposed to do it their way. That's not the way it works. We have to develop our own way. Like I said, eight years and then Susan Gross will be coming up to my classroom. I even, how, how many people have the world's greatest CI person in the whole world come to your classroom? I mean, and that still took me eight years. Tina Thompson Golo says, spelled differently from Golo, Golo, um, says all teachers discovery has, it says teachers discovery has, oh, library of fluency matters books. Well, how convenient is that? Go to the link and it says, um, Oh, it's a big link, but you can find out where Fluency Matters is. And it says, Tina thompson Godel says, all available from Teachers Discovery. So you can get them from Fluency Matters and from Teachers Discovery. Oh, here you go. Teachers Discovery comes in and says, here's more information on the invisibles on Ben's website. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, and there's a link there. Uh, Matt Daniel Johnson says these are in your last three books. I'm not sure what you mean, but no, the, the invisibles are not. See, because this was 2014, and then I went to India and I taught a sixth grade class. I'd never taught sixth graders, but you could talk about wonderful, you know, because they're like old enough to think abstractly. You know how Rudolf Steiner talks about how the brain changes from, from 13 to 14, 12 to 13. They begin to think more abstractly, but they still have that wild imagination of children. I don't think I would have come up with the invisibles in 2015 had I not had sixth graders. Because the seventh graders had been taught before using um, worksheets, and they just didn't want to hear it. The eighth graders were worse. And I, I know I'm going all over the place, but I would advise you, if you're starting comprehensible input, do not take your level two and three classes and four classes in there. Stay with the old program that you had established. Maybe do 10 minutes a day and let that grow. But if you go in, you want to make a mistake in the next few weeks when you start school, Say, okay, I went to a workshop. I know all about comprehensible input. Now all I have to do, all we're going to do, kids, is we're going to do something new. It's really going to be great. We're going to tell stories. <laughs> and the kids are going to go, right, another really cool thing. Attended a conference. You know, those kids are just, they're, they're worn out with new things, new cool new things. This is not a cool new thing. This is the way people are going to be teaching for the rest of the century because comprehensible input is the way people acquire languages. So get on the Teacher's Discovery website and get some of those uh, books from uh, Carol and all that and end up with uh, accepting that it's gonna take a long time, work at it, um, join one of the online groups, you can join mine on the invisibles. I actually have a, a Facebook thing that I started like just a few weeks ago that's only dedicated to compre to the invisibles. And that is which to answer McDaniel's question, no, they're not in these these new books. These new books. And they don't exist in hardback form, but they do exist online at my benslavic.com website. And except it's going to take a long time. If you want you can join my Facebook group. 
but I'm, I'm very, I won't go into why, but I'm very strict about who gets into that group. And that does exist. It is the, it's called, just go to Facebook, put Ben Slavic's Invisibles. That's the name of the group. We actually, the first name for it, uh, Greg Schwab, the CI guy in Chicago, was, uh, thought it, actually I thought the name up, but we were gonna do a conference next summer on the Invisibles because they're popping in 2020. And uh, so we decided to do it in the north suburb of uh, <clears throat> Chicago called Libertyville, I think. And we were talking about all that and we made the name uh, to be the Chicago Land, what a great word, Chicago Land Invisibles Conference. You break that down into an acronym, you've got CHIC, and that was the name of the Facebook page first, but I changed it on, on Greg's. Um, recommendation to Ben Slavic's Invisibles. But do know that lets me plug next summer's conference is, and it's gonna limit it to 50 people because that's all we can get in the place we're staying. It's a um, Christian place, you know, a retreat place. And, uh, <clears throat> but you have to know what you're doing before you come to the conference. One of the things that I really, don't do workshops or presentations or to go to workshops anymore is because I insist that the people have read and studied about comprehensible input, like that question about what is the, what are the basics? Um, I'm sure there are great trainers up, Carol, I know, certain, because I've seen her, um, great trainers in comprehensible input. I'm not one of them in terms of <laughs> making it really clear. I, I, I kind of like, if you come to my workshop next summer, it's Greg Schwab and I, and Amitabha will be there, cream of the cream, you all know that, with her 97 scripts, which I don't have that book here, but it's, it's from Teacher's Discovery. Um, it's gonna be a small, intimate thing. We want everybody to be perfectly prepared next summer. So, <clears throat> so if you wanna think about doing that, come on. But you got to get in early because we don't even have the website up for the conference, but get in early. Thank you, Christy. Let's see, no, you're the best. You really are. Talk about a great CI practitioner and leader. Bob Patrick. I knew it was Robert, but I was confusing it. Sorry, Bob, if you're watching this. I knew it was, I'm singing a Robert Harrell and I couldn't think. Um, sorry, it's Bob Pratt, Dr. Robert Patrick. We have Robert Harrell, Robert Patrick. I got it. Um, got my wires crossed there. Yeah, Bob Patrick is the Latin teacher who, along with the great John Piazza in San Francisco, the two of them have literally started as a small kind of group on my PLC 15 years ago. And then the Latin, are you ready for this? The Latin folks are doing the most innovative comprehensible in input instruction in the world right now under Bob's and John's leadership. So cool to see that. Maybe Latin just had, you know, they looked at comprehensible input as an unconscious function and they realized they were teaching the most conscious thinking oriented, logical, analytical, A implies B implies C verb, declensions and everything in Latin. Maybe that's why Latin is so exploding because they just said, we need comprehensible input. And people maybe, if you're not familiar with Latin, you're probably saying, well, you're probably saying to yourself, it's a dead language. No, it's not. It's being brought back to life by people like Bob Patrick and John Piazza. And you know what? That's a good thing. I once had kind of an experience where I was working with John and and I realized I'm hearing Latin. This is this whole thing is the Roman legions. It's all coming back to life. I don't know. It's you know, languages never disappear. I was doing a workshop with the uh, Sauk Indian tribe in. Uh, um, <clears throat> it's called the. Uh, I can't remember the name of the the official name of the tribe. 
But we were doing comprehensible input about 10 years ago down there. And if you're a native language teacher right now, it is with the greatest reverence that I realize that the bringing back of your languages, like Latin, is more than sacred. And I would have said 20 years ago before I heard about Susan Gross and Blaine Ray and Stephen Krashen, and Diana Nuna, Carol Gobb and the great leaders, I would have said they're gonna die out. But now with comprehensible input, I think there's, uh, there's hope there. Aren't so guess what? Jacqueline Costa, how long does it take to go around the star? Um, the fastest you can make it is two days. But if you're going to do a really good job, like with, um, okay, so two of the, two of the um, activities on the star are um, in the extend phase, phase five, toward the end of the star, is the word chunk team game. That's an entire day. The kids just won't stop complaining until they get the whole period on Friday to play that game. It's that much fun. Word chunk team game, and let's let's talk about one of the other activities. This is out of 30 things and activities you can do on the star. Um, reading from the back of the room. Right there is a day and a half. So <clears throat> you can speed it up and go around it. Like if like let's say you get a, a, a create a story that's not that great. That's gonna happen. We're talking about shoulders and pressure and heaviness on your shoulders as a teacher. Don't make pressure on yourself to make it a great story every time. Only Blaine can do that, Susan, the great ones. Do what you can. If the story sucks, flip around the star in a day and a half, two days. I would say that a week is about right. You can go longer. It depends on how each, can you see that back there? how each of those things, those activities that you do play out. I know that people who are on a timetable say, well, I have to teach uh, relative pronouns this week and then I that next week, and you're always on the same schedule as somebody else. That's not fun. Allow yourself, if you get into it, you can't, don't say, well, I gotta stop because we gotta go to the next activity. Just keep rolling. Always keep a high level of interest in your class. When it dwindles, naturally it's gonna dwindle, or if it never really takes off, that's fine. Go around the star quicker. Hope I answered that question. Martha, thanks for your comments, Ben. Our textbook does have some virtues, but the weakness is in the prepared assessments, yeah focusing too much on grammatical structures and written expression. And by the way, Martha, also those assessments focus on memorization too much. That involves the conscious mind. That's not comprehensible input. So that's why I said earlier, I don't know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes ago, I said, it's very difficult to mix the textbook. You've got to be an artist. I mean, I, ne I, I, I could never try it. Um, but if you have freedom, Martha says that her district is very small and she's in her fifth year, 20th year teaching languages. I guess she means fifth year doing, oh, at that school. And, and she worked closely with colleagues to try and move away from legacy methods. We get to hang out quite a bit because the textbooks units do focus on themes that are of interest to teens. Well, that's good. I could never make those themes interesting to teens because my conclusion after 20 years was I can't make it interesting unless it comes from them and it's in the form of a drawing. But that's just me, again. I don't speak Spanish, but my best friend is from Mexico. And he's teaching me. And so Deborah said, your work is so helpful. Mi gracias. Hope I said that right. Thank you, Deborah. That means a ton to me many times. Catalina says, I agree, you have to read. Um, reading is the high road. On that, 
graphic back there. Read it, look at it. I mean, see all those things in the bottom left corner? That's reading. That you do most of the star is reading. But but it's reading based on a rich contextual bed that the students understand by sound first in the creative phase at the top using card talk, <clears throat> individually created images, or one word images when you create and then you go around and you do the in the review phase and you go around and you do the writing you create the, that's not when the kids write they don't write in the third phase that's what you write and then they do the all the reading things and that's the main thing and then they do these wonderful extension activities and they couldn't read it if they hadn't created it and they know it by sound remember back to the kid with the ball <clears throat> i mean that's how language acquisition works let's face it you don't think about the language you hear it and then our job is we i love this if people ask me what my job is now, I'd say, we, we, um, I, I teach languages by turning sound into meaning. And then after that, you can just go crazy with all the. There are a few writing activities in here. And then when you get to the um, third year, they're so good. I had a kid uh, one time find a mistake on the national French exam. He got 69 out of 70 questions. And, and he came to me afterwards and he said, Mr. Slavic, <clears throat> kid's a genius, he went to Stanford in nanotechnology. <clears throat> he said, one of these questions didn't make sense to me. I contacted the American AATF, American uh, Association of Teachers of French, and they, it, it made this mistake, it was not a grammar mistake, it was a contextual mistake about the location of some town on an island in a reading passage, and there were six, native speakers who missed it and they had to admit it was wrong and i said to the kid well i, I said to the aatf will you change his score because he wants a perfect score of 70. and they said no we've already graded 22,000 exams and i said to the kid i said to eric do you do you need to have the 70. he said no he didn't need it but he was nice it was nice for him to know that he uh that was when i was doing the national french exam susan gross keep mentioning her, said, don't do those national exams. And I would even extend my own advice, and it's crazy because having taught advanced placement language and literature for 24 years, I would say don't do that. Don't even do, just don't do those big um, assessments. Summative assessment in foreign language is weird. It's, uh, uh, yeah, do the little quizzes and all those other things that are in, in these books. But don't get into that summit of assessment so much. It, it ruins language careers in children. Jacqueline, very generous offer. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I'm talking for if you've just tuned in, I'm talking about the free books you get. You get T. Paris in here, PQ and a Wink, and Stepping Stones to Stories for free. Just benslavic.com. Ben, I want the books. Okay, here they are. I'll attach them. I don't know. Um, teachers Discovery also makes, I, I, somebody asked about um, seeing this video again and they, they make the point again so you can watch the whole thing that just go to their website. Um, Jacqueline, you're the best. She says, Ben, you are stating the exact reason why I'm planning on using CI in the classroom equity. Okay. We've said a lot of words in this webinar today, but you know what? Equity is the most important word because we can no longer to dis afford in our society to disenfranchise kids that don't need it. They don't need to be disenfranchised. They need to be honored. And their capacities have to be respected. And that means we, the professionals, we're the adults in the classroom, need to teach in a way that honors that fact that they deserve to be educated at the same level and, and in such a way that they have the same opportunity as the kid who went to the white suburban school and, and had books around his or her house all the time and became much more adept at reading 
those kids who, who didn't have access to books in middle school will succeed at languages and our country will change as a result of it because that kid will have one reason to go to school and, and look forward to one thing and that's your class. Sorry, soapbox. But Jacqueline, when you mentioned that word equity and inclusion, that's why I was teaching in a private school in South Carolina for 11 years. And then I, I, I woke up one morning and I said, hey, I mean, I'm talking about the richest school in South Carolina, probably in the Southeast. Heathwood Hall and Episcopal School. If you're somebody from there, I'm sorry, but that's where I started my career. And I woke up one morning and I said, 1977. And I woke up somewhere like 1980s and I said, hey, I'm dividing the community of Columbia, South Carolina down racial and economic lines. That's not very patriotic. Let's include all the kids and they'll have one class. They won't let you know. They'll stay quiet. That's what high school kids do anyway. But they'll come to your class. And uh, each day that hoodie will go back just a little bit. And their posture will become squared up. And by the end of the year, you will see something. Christy said, um, Oh, Teachers Discovery is putting on a plug for Brian Candell presenting on creating classroom culture. Nice. Uh, join us here next week at, that's going to be the 15th at one o'clock uh, Eastern time, Eastern time, Ben, uh, to see Brian Candell present on creating ca classroom culture. Go for it. That sounds great. Christy Placido said this wonderful thing. Once you truly understand what CI is, you are not limited by any methodology. This is where you become really free. Yes, comprehensible input is a vast universe. It's not a method. And that's why there's like, it's okay for freaks like me to talk about CI like I do. And it's okay for everybody else to have their own vision of CI. Because, you know, it's so vast that it, it, it's, it's, it's flexible enough to um, interface with you as a person. Oh, here's, here's something you want to uh, search. These five words. This is from Christy Placido again. Fluency matters, comprehension-based readers. Those are the five words. Is a group for people who would like to know more about readers. And that's going to be, uh, I guess it's a Facebook group. Fluency matters, comprehension-based readers do it. Look at this, Christy. Thank you. Three words, no, four. CI Intermediate Students, another Facebook group. Lourdes says, what is your recommendations for a school block schedule of almost two hours of class two times a week? Use that star over there. Use that. Because if you have a two hour class, three times a week, two times a week, you need that star because you see it's self-propelling. You do one activity, you create the image using card talk, individually created images or, or one word images, and then you go and it propels itself into the review phase where you do a retell and then you review and, and, and then you give a quiz because that's part of the review. And then you go on around the star and it propels you to the next thing. So there's no way you can get nailed in a two hour class um, exhausted. I remember when I was teaching out of the book 24 years ago, uh, hundreds of years ago, thousands it feels like. And uh, I'd get into a class, I mentioned this before, into 20 minutes and I'd have a 52 minute class and I'd go like, God help me. I have no idea what I'm going to do. But now with the self-propelling thing around the star, you got it. Cool, thank you, Andrea. Um, okay, Teachers Discovery says we're running short on time and last minute comments or questions. And that is probably my cue to stop. Hey, 
Thanks for joining this um, webinar with Teachers Discovery. Go to their website, go to Fluency Matters, go to whatever websites you can find that will help you. Pull from them what you want. The person who asked about the basics, I feel guilty, I wasn't clear enough on the basics. They're really read about, just easy to read about, clear as a bell. Um, get a book and read about it. And mainly have faith in, in the idea that, that uh, Christy Placido just talked about, that the idea, this is so vast. Have faith that you're gonna run into a system now that is so big for you that you'll be able to, you'll be able to do it, you know? You'll be able to say, like for example, with that star, that I like, that part I don't like, I won't do it. I don't have to do that, uh, this thing. Or whatever, however you teach using comprehensible input. Uh, pick and choose. Um, just the main thing is flourish. I, you know, I looked that word up, it's from uh, flower. And last point about comprehensible input, and then we can end. A flower, a seed for a flower is put in the ground. It's gonna need, depending on the flower, you know how on the seed packets it always says 75 days to fruition or whatever, to where you see the flower. We need to respect that. There are some things that we're not allowed to know about. There are some things, like how a human being is formed, that we're not allowed to mess with. Things happen that are so magical and, and out of our ability to understand. The seed, we don't know how that works but we do need, know that we get a, a flower 75 days later. If there's, if there's any knock I would put on the traditional way of teaching, it would be that we, are, we have hubristically entered into a domain that is in the unconscious realm that is designed by none of us, no human being could ever design how we acquire language. And so that process, in a way, it takes all the pressure off our shoulders because all we have to do is speak to our children in the target language. And this is, takes our webinar full circle because remember what I said about what Robert Harrell said. I use messages in the target. Hey, could you go get that 97 scripts book over there? It's like one of these, but it just looks just like if it's got a yellow cover. Um, it's not a grammar driven curriculum. I'm sorry, I, Robert Harrell says, I use messages in the target language that my students find compelling and understandable to help them, I need that, to help them acquire the language unconsciously. And I do that because the research shows that people acquire unconsciously. So if you are just speaking to them in a, in a way that I understand, that's the basics of CI. That's all you have to do. We have a lot of different ways and schools of thought now. We used to have just TPRS, now we have a whole umbrella for, called Comprehensible Input Instruction. And we end up with the flower happening without our even knowing it, without our even knowing it. We just, all of a sudden, they can speak and write because we sheltered speaking and writing in the early, uh, years in order to favor comprehensible input. There's no term comprehensible output. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. I really want to plug this book because Anne Matava's work is the best. Um, I know we're wrapping up, so I won't go off on a jag on that. But yeah, so the flower grows. What right do we have? to go and put our fingers in the, in the soil and pull up the seed and look before it's ready to uh, show itself. It's that chapter, what, seven, six or seven in the little Le Petit Prince, where um, they talk about the, the, 
the whole thing with the flower, where the flower came from. Um, I wish I could remember the French. It's so beautiful in that book. But the, the metaphor is perfect for us, is do not make the mistake of putting your hands in the soil until that sprig comes up. And when that sprig comes up and we watch it grow, we don't have to manipulate. We don't have to use worksheets. We don't have to get the conscious mind involved. Just keep speaking in comprehensible input to your students. Yeah, can we order the star poster? I'm, it's not available yet, but it'll be on my website soon. <clears throat> we are wrapping up. Oh, Andrea, thank you. The flower metaphor is a great way to explain CI methods to parents who may not be familiar with this approach. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have faith. Flourish. And don't make it a job that you have to do that you dread going to. Now those days are over. We can enjoy our jobs. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> I'm uh, done.